My name is Yara Lee. I'm a dual U.S.-Brazilian citizen of uh, Korean descent. I'm a filmmaker and a human rights activist. I decided to join the Freedom Flotilla after going to Gaza a few months ago and seeing firsthand the devastation there. After hearing the pleas of the people living in Gaza to have the blockade lifted, I felt I must do something. The Gaza Freedom Flotilla was uh, on a humanitarian mission. We expected to be deterred from delivering our aid to Gazans, but we did not expect to be attacked. We started filming from the moment we boarded the Mavi Marmara, right through the Israeli assault on the ship. Although all our equipment was confiscated, we managed to smuggle this footage out. Mine is a high-definition footage of the flotilla attack, and also the only sustained footage of the ship and its passengers preceding the deadly Israeli commando raid. Watching this raw footage, you get a sense of the mood on the ship and of the passengers on it. Undoubtedly, many of you will be scrutinizing it for clues to resolve the mysteries that still surround what happened that fateful night. During this past week, the Israeli government has repeatedly alleged that these passengers, or some of them, laid a trap for Israel, duped the Israeli military, and plotted a lynching. Israel has repeatedly alleged that, that we were anti-Semitic Muslim fanatics connected to terrorist organizations. In fact, the passengers on our mission came from many countries and religions and ethnic backgrounds. Our one common denominator was that we wanted to end the humanitarian crisis in Gaza by highlighting the injustice of Israel's blockade. Prime Minister Netanyahu said, uh, this wasn't the love boat. This was a flotilla of terror supporters. Our footage will help you decide whether we were a love boat or a hate boat. You'll see secular and devout passengers. You'll see people at prayer and people working at their laptops. Was this a lynch mob moved by hatred of Israelis or was it a cross section of humanity moved by the plight of Gaza? Did we lay a trap for the Israeli commanders, or did they unnecessarily attack us? Did we take them by surprise, or did they take us by surprise? Do you see a premeditated ambush, or do you see some passengers using items at hand to protect themselves from an unprovoked assault by heavily armed commandos? You'll decide. We'll now watch the footage, which is approximately one hour in length. After that, I'll be answering some questions. I have another At 11 p.m., we saw the two Navy ships, and then we were just like surprised because we were in the middle of international waters. We thought this was going to be during the day, you know, and closer to Gaza. But they came in the middle of international waters and uh, assaulted us, uh, basically kidnapped us after the killing and took us to Israel. And. Uh, uh, when we got to Ashdod port in Israel, they started interrogating us and they kept saying, do you know you're gonna be deported because you're illegally in Israel? And we were like, you kidnapped us. We didn't wanna be here in Israel. Since we were hundreds of people, the, when the commandos came down, as you saw, some of them were captured but, uh, uh, and, and injured, but uh, we felt, and I think today in the New York Times came out that one of our uh, doctors treated the injured uh, Israeli uh, commander because uh, maybe we thought, by example, they would do the same, you know, and give us uh, uh, medical support, but that was not the case. They ignored us despite the fact that we kept announcing that we needed uh, uh, medical support because we were not prepared. We, you know, we thought we were going to have some sort of like a verbal confrontation or maybe they would shoot in the air to scare us or shoot on the foot, but not that they were going to come and start killing everybody. So we were not medically prepared. As you saw, you know, people were like slingshots, poles, chairs, whatever they could get hold of. It was very disproportionate. This, this booklet that the, the Israeli soldier dropped, actually I stopped and to look and they were not the ones that they wanted to kill, they were the ones probably that they didn't want to kill because I saw the uh, uh, member of parliament from Germany and I saw this like 85 year old archbishop, you know, and I, I was like, no, this is not the list of people they want to kill, these are the list they say, if we kill, it's trouble. 
the first thing they did was to confiscate all our laptops and Blackberries and cell phones and electronics because they knew this was going to be the best way to not have any communication go out. And uh, they didn't anticipate that we had this backup, the organization had this backup satellite system that was able to transmit some of the tragedy. I'm sure if they saw someone white Norwegian looking, they were not like trying to kill because they know it's a lot more trouble. And I think that's exactly what happened. The outrage in the world is because we had Norwegians, Swedish, uh, Brazilians, and you know, because they kill so many people in Gaza, nobody did anything in the world. They keep so, kill so many people in Lebanon, you know? True, when we arrived in the ship, there was, there was a whole thing about checking our luggage and the, and the people, yeah, it's true. And then they sent the ladies to this uh, room and the man to the other, and they did check if we had anything, yeah. We were documenting the whole journey. We interview everybody, and you know, and uh, I mean, we interview even this Lebanese guy who uh, lost his four children and his wife during the Lebanon uh, war in 2006. And uh, he, despite the fact of losing his whole family, he says, "I'll resist, but I won't use violence." You know, so we were pretty like. Uh, restrained and very focused about knowing that this would be stupid to kind of like kill an Israeli soldier, even if they did have the opportunity. But, you know, it's good that they show restraint. They got injured but not killed by any of our passengers. We were never expecting like full-blown commanders coming as if we were in a war. Yeah, when they kidnapped us and took us to Ashdod port, they had this huge infrastructure to process us. It's like so many people hired to like take our fingerprint and then we go to another desk and they make all these questions and then the other desk for the photocopy of the passport and then the other desk for, you know, looking at us. It was like an incredible infrastructure they had to process all these hundreds of people. And then each of us, uh, you know, s smaller groups were thrown in this, uh, uh, not a bus, it's like this high security vehicle. And uh, we were transported to this uh, jail, this jail facility an hour and a half from, uh, uh, from the port. Uh, it was in the southern part of uh, Israel. And when we arrived there, it was like a, a new facility. And I read at the Jerusalem Post that they had prepared this, this, this facility for us a few weeks before our ships came. <laughs> So they already had a plan. So in fact, I myself was prepared to go to jail. I was just not prepared for all the killing, you know. Uh, they sent us on these buses to Ben Gurion uh, Tel Aviv airport. And then we found out that we were all going to Istanbul. At that point, we didn't even understand what was going on. And then we learned that the uh, Turkish prime minister had sent a Turkish airline planes to evacuate us all. We sat there for many, many hours, and the uh, Prime Minister of Turkey says, if this gentleman, President Ihaha, the IHH, is not returned, this is a declaration of war. No, the first thing they did was to confiscate our electronics, because I think the idea was we are, we are, not, we are not gonna let any information come out, and uh, I remember when we, were brought down to the ship, uh, to the lower level. They had already, you know, taken all the contents of all our bags and mixed together it was this big pile of things. And then there was another pile full of laptops. And then uh, they had these boxes where they would just throw all our cell phones in. And they kept saying, oh, you're gonna get everything back at the end. You're gonna get everything back at the end. You know, but that's their methodology. You know, they just wanna get rid of you complaining. So they always say, they even confiscated my little notebook because, you know, when they took out all my um, uh, Blackberry and electronics, I started getting everybody's email address again by hand. And they saw that, like, no, you're not taking this either. A um, lot of people lost, like, uh, over $100,000 equipment because we had, like, high-definition uh, equipment, lenses, you know, just our microphone was $4,000. So, you know, and they don't care. They even had the audacity of using the material that they stole and editing things that were good for their propaganda. We need to apply international law. As I said, it's not an anger that comes from emotional anger. It's, it's like it's an absurd that we live in 2010 and we have countries that are excluded from international law. 
we are definitely ready for a bigger flotilla with more countries represented and more people. In fact, Brazil, uh, since I'm the only Brazilian, uh, and the Brazilian press has given incredible coverage, in two hours of Facebook announcing that, should we have a Brazilian ship? I got 50 people to sign up. There are still many things to be uh, discussed, like some people disappeared, and we still don't know where are they, you know. For Some us, of the people injured, we couldn't even take from Tel Aviv Air um, Hospital because if we had transported them onto the Turkish airline plane and taken to right Istanbul, yeah. they would have died. We want to make a legal case, and we are talking to a lot of international lawyers, you know, and uh, lawyers in the U.S., and there are so many things that we can sue. Like, you know, the stealing of our equipment, the, you know, the abuse, the international water assault, the kidnapping, there are many, many things. Yeah, the U.S. government has, be, has been a big impediment to the application of international law, but uh, I think uh, we are going to keep putting pressure and all the other, I think it was the only country that didn't condemn in a, in a very strong fashion, you know, because every country in the world condemned these actions. Even when I was interviewing a big variety of people, I did not come across anyone that was really, like, you know, radical. Everybody was kind of more on the naive side, you know. They kept saying, oh, we're going to pray, and we're going to get there. And I was like, it's not about praying, it's about international law, you know. <laughs> this siege is not legal. Journalists and passengers were treated the same, no respect whatsoever. The first people they wanted to confiscate material from was the journalists, you know. We even have this horrible precedent where Rachel Corey, another American citizen, she was like in front of these bulldozers to avoid this house demolition project. And they just went over her. Did the American government say anything? Nothing. You know? So. The American government provides weapons and uh, military assistance, and uh, even when we have American citizens killed, they don't do anything.